Welcome to the Extra Dimension. This episode is part of a mini series about transportation, largely inspired by a series of articles on Vox.com. Today, Savannah Haslow, Andrew Bailey, and Ian R. Buck will talk about public transportation. Find the show notes for this episode of the Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED14. So I think before we start, we should let everybody know what each of our individual experiences with public transportation have been, because that's going to color our interpretations of things and our our opinions of, you know, public transportation. So Andrew, why don't you go first? Uh, I take light rail a few times a week. Cool. I didn't know if you wanted any more than that, but... Uh, I I mean, I guess how long you've been using it also matters. Uh, well, it kind of started when I moved back in February or March, so I've been doing it for a few months. Okay, and then before that, you primarily just used car? Yeah. Cool. I've been using public transit for about five years regularly. Mostly buses, the light rail relatively often, and I've visited big cities with really good subway systems, Boston and D.C. Nice. Yeah, I uh, one of my biggest regrets is that I never really learned how to use a bus system until after I came back from college, because I actually learned how to use a transit system when I was off in Sweden senior year of, of college, and I, you know, I, by that time we just relied on Google Maps to like figure out the routes instead of having to memorize lines and stuff. Um, so that was a skill that I never really developed was actually knowing a system as opposed to like having it told to me. But yeah, now, now I use the, the bus system whenever I can, assuming that I cannot bike to my destination. And I probably would use it to get to my work, but I've never had to because my work has always been a mile from home. So I just walk. So I've, yeah, I've never had to rely on public transit, but I, I like using it. Um, so let's talk about just the overall pros and cons of public transportation systems. So first off, from the rider's perspective, it's like the cheapest form of, of powered transportation available by far. And also, like, if you take a look at it from the overall everybody in, in a metro area, like, it's most, it's most efficient when lots of people use public transit as opposed to almost any other system, any other system that exists today anyway. It helps us to have less cars on the road, so congestion is uh, is helped along by increased public transportation. And also, here's my personal favorite: I don't have to worry about parking. My goodness, yes. yeah. <laughs> like even even if you have uh, a designated parking lot for that, you know, that's provided like by work or something, like just the hassle of like, okay, now I got to go into the parking ramp and like find a spot and. That's a, that's a lot of business that I don't want to deal with. But the trade-off, of course, is that you're going to have to walk more because the stops are not going to be like right next to where you're trying to go. Which you might actually do on purpose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're, you mean if you're like a, a planner for the public transportation system? Um, I was thinking about if you're like really fat and need exercise. Oh, sure. Okay. Hey, it's me. <laughs> no, but actually I would do that. I would uh, leave the house early and walk as far as I could make it before the bus would catch up to me, and then get on. Mm. And especially in today's world of Pokemon Go. Very important. And then um, the last one that I put here for pros is kind of a kind of a tenuous one, um, but a sense of community, right? Because you're, you're out there with other people, kind of... Depends on how much to... you want to talk to strangers. Exactly, exactly. You were talking to two ladies today, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they were going to, like, a, a World Cup uh, soccer game over in Minneapolis or something. And Apparently like, that happens. I guess, yeah. Um, also, there was that time at, like, 11 p.m. when we got on the bus and it was packed, and then, like... We, we had ju- leftover pizza and yeah. we just distributed it. Yep. Everybody loved us. <laughs> that was great. But, yeah, like, it, I, yeah, because that depends on kind of how you how you deal with being forced to be in close proximity to strangers. So cons, uh, involve, uh, things like the buses don't always run on time. (laughs) Almost never. Like, especially if you're taking the 63 over on the east side of St. Paul. For some reason. 
even if even if the bus is running on time, if you're not running quite on time, you can easily like be walking to the bus stop and then you watch the bus go by and you're like, crap, I've got to wait for like another 15 to 30 minutes Mm -hmm. for the next one. Honestly, at night, it's easiest to uh, walk from downtown to our house. Right, because the frequency is much, much lower. Yeah, because I'd have to either wait 30 minutes for a bus or walk home in 20. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Depends on how much you hate that walk up that quarter mile bridge. I despise it, but it's better than standing around. <laughs> yeah. Also, taking public transit is only really viable along routes that like the transit planners have accounted for. So if you live in a neighborhood that gets ignored by like a lot of the urban planning, you're kind of screwed. Mm-hmm. Which is a like a big theme. In this series of episodes, I think, because we also talked about that in the cycling episode where we were talking about bike sharing. And uh, since we live up on Dayton's Bluff, east side of St. Paul, nobody cares about us. There are no bike sharing stations out there either. We're pretty lucky that we live two blocks away from the bus line that goes straight downtown. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Speaking of downtown, quite often... They're set up where, like, most lines just go into downtown, and then you have to transfer in downtown to another line to get places, which compounds the issue of, like, buses inherently take longer than just driving yourself in a car. And, like, if if you're going from one point on Route 63, for example, to another point on Route 63, it's not quite so bad. Like, yeah, the bus stops every few blocks for people to get on and off, but you're still just taking, you know, you're just being driven from one place to another. If you have to go and get on to another bus, then we're talking you have to wait at a bus stop for another, like, 10, 15 minutes to get onto the next bus, and then, you know. So, yeah, it can take a long time. Mm-hmm. I had to be on the bus or at a stop for an hour to get to just somewhere in, in Falcon Heights from the east side of St. Paul. Like... Yeah. That's ridiculous. That's so crazy. Um, and then, uh, rain, weather. You know, when you're, when you're not on the bus, you're at the mercy of the weather. And we live in Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they do have, like, at some of the more busy bus stops, they'll have, like, heaters and, like, ceilings and stuff for you to stand under. But, like, that's not the case most of the bus stops that you'll go to. At least not in here in the Twin Cities. How about Pittsburgh? There's a few, but it's... I think you could only really fit about ten people under them. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, and then inevitably one person smoking and the rest of us hate them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of smoking and fires... Yeah, sometimes there's fires in tunnels, which is kind of bad if you're, you know, riding a subway through there. Or in general, just, you know, maintenance. It seems like a lot of uh, public transit systems at least here in America, are rather underfunded. Mm -hmm. This past Sunday, uh, there was a, uh, well, I guess we'll talk about a little bit later, there was a fire in the Pittsburgh subway. And then I heard uh, in, was it New York City, that one of the lines between uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan is going to be like shut down for like a year and a half. Oh, wow. So that that they can just fix this, this one tunnel. And apparently it hasn't been doing too well since Sandy blew through. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, wow, yeah, that's going to affect a lot of people for a long time. Yeah. That's crazy. And and we've been complaining about 3rd Street, you know, getting torn up for, uh... Oh, I'm still going to complain. It affects me directly. Of course. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, let's talk about... Some of the some of the big problems with public transportation from the perspective of somebody who relies on it to get to and from work. So there's there's kind of a twofold problem here because the locations of jobs has been kind of shifting over time. It used to be like um, that all of the jobs were kind of centered inside the city, right? Um, that's why there was the city center. And then you had like some residential areas around downtown and everybody kind of went into downtown to work and they came out of downtown, you know, when it was time to go home. But as the, as the suburbs kind of expanded more and more, now there are more like service type jobs that need to be done out in the suburbs. 
um, where, you know, the rich people live, but like the people who are going to be doing those service type jobs live closer to the city center. So they need to be able to get out from the city into suburban areas to work and then get back. But going the opposite directions, everyone else is going pretty much. Yeah. And the, the problem is that like American suburbs weren't taking, didn't really make strong public transportation systems as they were being built. Because uh, they were built upon the premise of a car. Exactly, because the people yeah. who were going to be living there were going to be owning cars. Uh, or so, rather assumed to be owning cars. I- exactly, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, there's like, there's this, there's this huge disconnect now of like what's needed versus what is easily built. Um, since we already have, you know, like we've established what our cities are what what they look like, what they're built around. It's also kind of a, like, public transportation is a really poor choice for commuting in a lot of cases because that's a time-sensitive activity, mm-hmm. right? You need to get to work on time, and you need to be reliable. Otherwise, your bosses are going to be mad at you. Um, and if you, the public transit system where you live is not very reliable, or if it's, you know, if, if there isn't a high frequency of of, like, buses at the stops, then if you, you know, if you miss just one, then you're screwed. You're going to be at least half an hour to an hour late to work. You leave at least half an hour before you should have to leave. Yeah. At any given point, coming back, whatever. But that means, but when you're going to a place and you leave that early, that means you're at work often half hour to an hour before you need to be. And you're just stuck there. Mm -hmm. That's great. I used to live in Midway and work in Bloomington. Yeah. That was ass. That was quite, quite the commute. I have no perspective on that, but I take it it's a lot. Well, yeah. you have to go back, backwards into downtown and then forwards into Bloomington. And it took like an hour, hour 20. Yeah, so the, the biggest uh, landmark near Savannah's old work was the Mall of America. Um, which is south of the Minneapolis downtown yeah. area. And uh, downtown St. Paul, you know, is east of the Minneapolis mm-hmm. downtown area. So kind of going at a diagonal there down to Bloomington. Yeah, I've, I've actually been inside that airport. I almost got lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, that would be a 20, 25 minute drive tops. And it took an hour 20 mm-hmm. over public transit. I was actually looking at, since since uh, one of the jobs that I'm considering for next summer is working at the Boy Scout Base Camp, which is down by Fort Snelling, down mm-hmm. by the Mall of America, um, I was like, I wonder how long of a bike ride that would be. And I took a look at it, I'm like, I'm not going to do that every day. No. Maybe, maybe once in a while, but not very often. <laughs> Interesting phenomenon is that uh, there are some cities that have very high housing costs, but um, they've done a very good job with their public transit systems. And so the cost of living in those cities is kind of like balanced out mm-hmm. um, in a way, like in a way that you wouldn't think. So like think of uh, New York City, DC, San Francisco, they, you know, they have the reputation of having very, very high rent costs. Um, but if you can get away with not owning a car there, that partially, you know, helps out. Yeah. But, you know, there's, uh, you know, the public transit options, which, uh, see, I, if I'm trying to remember it correctly, the one time I took a trip to New York City that we actually, the, me and my parents actually stayed at some uh, lady's house in New Jersey, then took, you know, like commuter rail into the city. Mm-hmm. But, you know, even now, if you look hard enough, you can, you know, find Tons of stories of people who commute four hours daily uh, round trip. Yeah, that's uh, so gross. In in New York City, even with, you know, public transit. Yeah, and I mean, the the East Coast, like, kind of train system that goes up and down the East Coast kind of, I mean, I've never experienced it, but I am fascinated by it because it seems like the most most Europe-like public transit thing that we have here in the United States. Yeah. Or at um, least just anything on rails, rather. Yeah. Of course, it doesn't extend very far away from the coast. Yeah. Or even south. Yeah. So speaking of long commutes, um, those uh, long commutes and uh, sprawling metro areas are correlated with lower economic mobility. 
Um, and a really good example of that is the Atlanta area. Cause that is like, that is a huge, huge metro area. I think, I think of the Twin Cities metro area is pretty darn big. Um, but like Atlanta just goes like everywhere in all directions. That's, that's kind of what I think of the city is just kind of, you know, it, it like it, God just kind of threw up all over the floor and there it is. <laughs> and like urban sprawl makes it very, very difficult for transportation planners to create, uh, effective, you know, public transportation routes. Mm-hmm. And in some ways that makes me wish that we had more geographic barriers here in Minnesota, because there's nothing stopping the Twin Cities from just expanding in all directions. Whereas I've seen maps of, of other cities that were like built in valleys and it's like, okay, so they've got a light rail that just goes up and down the valley. And that's all. That's the only place it needs to go because that's the direction that the city goes. Well, other than barring mountains, what other geographic barrier would really? Yeah, I know because we can build as many bridges as we want. Um, a lake, possibly if it was a big enough lake. Yeah, um, we've got an ass ton of lakes. We just kind of swallowed them up. Yeah, I mean we've got a river that goes straight through our metro area and it doesn't stop anybody. It, we've got Except lots of the bridges. Buses. <laughs> See, when I was uh, living out in Salt Lake City, I rode their light rail about twice. And, you know, it's it's actually more of a, like a cross. You know, it goes from southern part of the valley into downtown hmm. Salt Lake. And then it goes from the uni- uh, University of Utah off to the east uh, over to the airport sort of in the west. Hmm. So for some reason this summer I actually had a dream about being in Salt Lake City and using their public transportation system, which was like a series of elevators that moved up and down and side to side. <laughs> okay. And the it only other... It certainly was not like that. Yeah, no. And the only other detail I remember from that dream is that you could hear the entire Mormon Tabernacle Choir from anywhere in, in the city. So... <laughs> This dream brought to you in part by Cards Against Humanity, I guess. Back to talking about reality. Because of all these difficulties in designing transportation systems and sprawling metro areas and everything, um, the typical U.S. metro resident can only reach about 30% of the jobs that are available in their metro area, which is, like, it's hard enough to find a job without that limitation you know so that's just that's just awful and if you don't have a job you can't get a car to access the other 70 percent. yep vicious cycle Mm -hmm. yeah like even when i've been looking for jobs that you know occasionally i'd find an opening in uh, monroeville which is very off to the east of pittsburgh okay whereas whereas i'm in like the west or like maybe like southwest and yeah if you need to go through downtown pittsburgh uh, try not to. Um, so, yeah, like, I'd probably either have to move or something. And that's ridiculous, because that's not even that far. And, really. you know, it's it's practically on the far side of the moon, which, ironically, there is a township called Moon that I live sort of next to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, not that moon. Hey, I'm looking at a map of Pittsburgh, and I found Monroeville. Yeah. There we uh, go. Moon, Moon is over by the airport. Okay. So I see that. So buses versus light rail systems. There's an interesting difference there in terms of the ridership. Um, turns out that the median income of rail riders is higher for most metro areas than the median income of bus riders. And... This probably doesn't result from, like, preferences. It probably more results just from the fact that, like, rail systems are going to be built uh, along routes that are going to serve higher uh, income riders. Also, is the are the rail systems the same price range as the buses in every case? That's true. Ours is, but I don't believe that's the case for all of them. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. I don't know if they controlled for that or not. Yeah. Also, transit lines, transit lines that connect high and low income neighborhoods can have a positive impact by reducing the isolation of communities. Okay. What do you mean? Which is pretty well. So, okay. This is assuming that people are, are going to use the public transit lines and not like just drive themselves everywhere. But if you, if you ride 
the bus with a lot of different people who don't share your same background, then it can have a positive net impact on like like the the relationships among different areas of the community. Okay. So I guess I guess what I put up there as a pro at the beginning wasn't so as tenuous as I thought it was. Yeah. Next, let's talk about some ways that city planning can impact transit systems. So we talked last episode about bikes and how cul-de-sacs are awful for encouraging people to bike um, because they like just they artificially increase the distance that you have to bike to get somewhere, and it's not as big of an issue if you're driving because like cars are fast. But cul-de-sacs are also bad for transit lines because it takes a lot longer to walk to a bus stop if you live in a cul-de-sac. Last episode, we talked about having, like, multi-use areas. So instead of just having, like, residential and then, like, a separate area for businesses and stuff, if we have mixed-use neighborhoods, then more of the amenities that you're going to need will be closer to you, which will Mm -hmm. encourage people to walk and bike more. Probably doesn't affect transit as much public transit because if if they're that close together then you're not going to take the bus to like go three blocks yeah that's true and that that does remind me of you know bigger cities in japan where literally everything is walkable Mm -hmm. you walk to school you walk to the store you walk home everything is walkable all the time and not just like a 10 miles away is yeah walkable so the the big problem with that that I can think of is is one that I have in real life, um, and that's like okay, so even if all of the stuff that I could need is going to be within a walking distance, that in that does not guarantee that all of my friends live within a walking distance, right? Because because yeah. I have friends from college who live all over the metro area, mm-hmm. and there's there's nothing short of like a forty minute drive that will get me to where they are, right? And that's you know as you can imagine, forty minute drive compound that out to a public transit ride that's going to be awful that's why you just stick them all in the same house as you yeah exactly that's our strategy (laughs) we live yeah we live in a house with uh four to five other young adults at at a time it's great Mm -hmm. so as we said earlier i think uh as suburbs expanded here in america anyway um they didn't really invest in strong transit lines because like at the time Cars were big, you know, this is like the 1950s and 1960s. And because, everyone, because everyone came back from the war, and we fought to earn this stuff! Yes! <laughs> Actually, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the interstate system was largely a result of uh, World War II, right? Probably. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, I, Autobahns say hi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also, like, in addition to everybody wanting cars, the, the public transit landscape was in a really tough spot at the time because that was right about the time that the streetcars were like going through the last phase of of their death so there wasn't really like they weren't going to be able to just like turn around and like suddenly expand public transit systems out into these new suburbs when they were like actively taking them apart in the middle of the cities are are we going to mention the conspiracy yes yes so so we'll, we'll dig into streetcars in a moment but for, first, let's finish talking about city plans. Also, especially here in America, there's an attitude that public transit is like a welfare program and is, you know, like we, we have to have it there so that all those poor people can get to their works and, oh, gosh, I got to pay taxes for it, which which kind of limits a lot of what we can do to improve the systems. Because when, when that attitude is in place, there's a lot of pushback against improving them too much and there's also the problem of like people don't want to increase the fares too much because the assumption is that everybody who rides the bus is poor so we can't go higher than like a dollar 25 you know for for like what you're charging for it so a lot of it has to be subsidized and it's pretty hard to expand a system like that where most of the money is not actually coming from the users. Mm-hmm. So, so that's your fare over there. No, think, it's one seventy five regular yeah. and two twenty five for Rush or Express. Yep. 
which uh, is really low, I know, in terms of, you know, overall yeah. the U.S. Yeah, over here it's like 250 and like 375 for Rush. Yuck. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I think they're going to be reducing those to just like 250 standard everywhere in January. Hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I hardly ever think about what the cost to ride on the bus because I don't have to use change. I, we just have the bus card. Yeah. That you just flash yeah. flash against the little thing and it's like, okay, like... Ding! I, yeah. I, I put $200 on this thing, like, I don't know, three years ago. I'm I, When it starts to run low, I'll get an email. <laughs> How nice. Also, national politics are kind of skewed towards rural interests, so urban... Like and because a lot of like the transportation kind of priorities comes down from the federal government, it's it's pretty hard to for there to be like a big nationwide push towards uh, better public transit systems. Because unlike the interstate system, you know, it's clear that the interstate system like benefits everybody everybody in all parts but like you know that they're not there's not going to be a big emphasis on like okay so we're going to improve how you can get around pittsburgh and get around the twin cities but like not get from the twin cities to pittsburgh you know at the same time it's also unfortunate yeah but if we had some nice trains i mean you know the revival of trains in theory theory, i could take an amtrak but that would take like (laughs) yeah yay megabus (laughs) <laughs> Which I actually have rode uh, Amtrak uh, from Ohio to Salt Lake a few times before. Wow. That's a ways. Yikes. Yeah. We have such a big country. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. We already mentioned transfers downtown. Um, yeah. The other, that's... another thing about city planning is that a lot of cities weren't planned to have vehicles in general. A lot of, you know, older city centers and older mm-hmm. areas, they weren't yeah. planned to have that kind of uh, use even that the kind of vehicle use that it has now, even without the public transit system and the roads just aren't big enough or designed for Mm -hmm. having a public transit system, giant buses going up and down. Yeah. Alongside all of these, all of these cars. Yeah. And even when they tried to do stuff like that, it's just, it turned out kind of ass. And then, uh, you know, especially over here in Pittsburgh, the topography is kind of, uh, brutal let's just say because uh like on the western side of downtown across the river there's something called mount washington oh it's it's Hmm. about a 200 foot hill right on the edge of the river nice and and there's a few tunnels to get through there and yeah it kind of (laughs) sucks oh i think i see those tunnels they must be the really straight ones yeah the fort pit tunnel uh i'm looking at the liberty tunnel yeah, the fork pit is uh, to the west there, but uh, yeah, and especially like that highway getting up to there, mm-hmm. it, it kind of stops during rush hour. Yikes. Oh, is that the tunnel that 376 goes through? Yep. Okay, yeah. But it's a pretty nice view once you get out there. Take, so, take like, your nice camera out there. One of the you know core pieces of advice of driving around Pittsburgh is you don't slow down at tunnels. Hmm. So, but there's a huge interchange like right in front of it. So, oh it yeah, kind of difficult. I think if you look closely enough, you'll find uh, the uh, what you call the uh, Port Authority Tunnel, which is dedicated to buses and trolleys. That's it. Oh wow. So yeah, if you if you never took public transit, you might not even really know that that's there. Yeah. Do you guys have things called busways? Like specific lanes for buses? Well, specific lanes, even specific uh, rights of way. A little bit. Like entire roads? Um, not really. The, so the buses have some some advantages that, that other drivers can't. Like uh, buses, a lot of times on, on the highway, if, the, if it's you know gridlocked, they're allowed to just drive on the shoulder around everybody else. Mm-hmm. But other than that, like, there aren't really, they, they have to share the road for the most part with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, and generally that's the case here, but there are dedicated roads just for buses going around Pittsburgh. Hmm. Um, you know, I know that there is that one ramp that I see buses going onto and getting off of over by the state fairgrounds. Yeah. That I have no idea where it goes. Because yeah. I, you know, I've never Buses driven on it. Buses go and they alive. vanish. Yeah. That's just how it is. It's very Night Vale. <laughs> Back where I used to live, 
I used to drive past, you know, a ramp marked specifically buses only just before I got off, uh, you know, to go to work. But uh, there'd be a few days where I drive past there and there'd be a car driving down that ramp. Hmm. Uh, some days there I saw two cars drive down that ramp. And they generally seem to be very nice cars with guys with suits uh, driving them. Illuminati. So I imagine that there were probably, you know, like douchebags, executives who probably don't give a damn. Yeah, probably. And they can just get away with it. Like, I'm not sure if there's a fine for that, but like, you know, if they would put like a hundred dollar fine and post an officer there every morning, uh, they'd be raking in the dough for sure. Yeah. Much as they would if they actually tried to catch people who are on the light rail, uh, the green line, yeah. who aren't, who didn't pay. Even the one time I didn't swipe my card and the officer caught me, I was just like, oh, it must not have scanned. I'm sorry. I'll do it later when I get off. Uh, no, I didn't. What? I noticed that you didn't scan it when we uh, got on I today. I scanned it you... at the bus. It, if yeah, I scanned I it again, it would just would have been like, all right, you're still within your two and a half hour limit. Sure, but like, I think... I think if somebody came by and like scanned your card, then it wouldn't have said that you had scanned into the light rail. Yeah, but when they caught me mm -hmm. the one time, they were like, did you just get off a bus? Do you have your transfer? Did you scan it then? I'm like, no, I just, it, just didn't, it just didn't work. I'm sorry, I thought it hit. Just bat your eyes. Yeah. So under the current fare regime in Pittsburgh, when you're going into downtown, you pay when you get on. Mm -hmm. When you're go going out of downtown, you pay when you get off. Interesting. Blah, it's Why? confusing to me. I know. Like, they're doing a whole revamp of the fare system uh, for next year. And, you know, along with uh, having a flat fare for everything. Because right now, like, there's particular zones, like, the further you get out from downtown. Yeah, that's oh, how so That's how uh, Stockholm was structured, too. Yeah. Which is really confusing for me because we were using that for tourism. <laughs> so the yes. so in Pittsburgh they have you pay, they're having you pay when you get off because people were getting on in a downtown zone with with a lower fare and then riding it all the way out. Uh, maybe because like all the buses and the light rail is free downtown, mm. so I'm pretty sure that has something to do with it. Yeah, because we have we have a um. A downtown zone in Minneapolis that it's seventy five cents to get on, but and you're supposed to, you know, pay more if you're going out of that zone, but mm -hmm. nobody does. No, that's not regulated. I would, yeah, I would imagine if you actually transferred, uh, you know, to yeah, another you have bus, to pay then, the extra if you yeah. transfer. So, but if you get off and you don't transfer, then so, you're probably so paying. like they're encouraging everyone to use their uh, fare cards. Mm -hmm. So like you know you just put money on it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you use that. It'll remember, hey, you just scanned like 30 minutes ago somewhere else, so I'm going to count this as a transfer and charge you less. Yeah, that's um, that's what ours do as well. Yeah, so because right now they actually have to, you know you actually have to ask the operator or the driver, hey, I'd like a transfer. Yeah. And then and then you scan and they give you a little piece of paper. Weird. You to... So you have to use your card and the paper. Yeah. That's bizarre. So, uh, ours, all of ours is just stored on the card. Yeah. So right now, you know, they've you know realized, oh, this is kind of stupid. So we're gonna like improve this a little bit. Yeah. Speaking of talking to the operator, that's one of the phenomenons on the bus that kind of like baffles me the most is people like just going up to the driver and be like, hey, so how do I get to like this other place from this route? Why does that baffle you? Because it's like you got on the bus without knowing where you were going and how you were going to get there like well yeah people, that would freak me out you know, i need to plan out my route before i get on the bus if you if you notice yeah. it's mainly older people that do that that's sure. people who grew up without the smartphones without the internet to tell them it's people who grew up getting on the bus getting a pamphlet or asking the driver where they're going mm -hmm. so they're uh -huh. just used to that but like it, it it didn't even seem like people were asking about so what other route do i transfer to to get to this thing like the, the driver today was telling people, like, oh, yeah, get off at this stop and then walk two blocks to the essay over there. And it's like, what advice were they getting from him? Like, what? Well, <laughs> a, a, lot of, a lot of times as well, it's just, like, confirming where you are, confirming your mm. route. Someone more knowledgeable than you, making sure that you have saw the, sure. seen the right thing and you're getting off at the right place at the right time. So uh, A trusted authority figure. Yes. Yeah. People are very reliant on bus drivers. And did you see... Today, 
there was a, apparently a woman who had asked where to get off, and as her stop was coming up, the bus driver called her up and yeah, reminded started, her, reminded her, and gave her instructions. And then like four other people came up and asked the bus driver things as well. Like that's a very nice thing to have, mm-hmm. a very nice resource. I still but, would never uh, do it. <laughs> yeah, there's um. There's a lot of people on the public transit systems, too, that get to know their regular bus drivers. There are a bunch of people that just sit there and chat with the bus driver for the duration of their time on the bus. And Liv and I had a bus driver once that would, instead of dropping us off a block away from where we were, he saw us walking up to work every day and decided just to drop us at the driveway to work. Nice. Every day. It was great. Cool. Like that guy. (laughs) (laughs) And then, uh, yeah, especially around here, it seems like the... uh... You know, the light rail complements the bus rather mm-hmm. than the other way around. But, uh, I, you know, I kind of needed to use it once when my bike broke down. I'm like, okay, so there's going to be a stop, you know, up here to get back onto the light rail, right? And he's like, yeah, see, I think he was nice enough to let us and, a, like, a, you know, me and a few other people off, you know, a little bit ways before that. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, so speaking of streetcars, they used to be kind of the dominant form of public transportation in the U.S., right? But then something happened. At some point, they went away. And there's there's a, a very popular kind of conspiracy... The- not really conspiracy theory, because, I mean, there, there were, like, Senate hearings and investigations and stuff on the, on the matter. Andrew, you want to tell us what those were? So, apparently... Like, all these uh, streetcar companies, they started, you know, losing money because after about 30 years of operation, stuff kind of breaks down. Mm. So they needed to have some money, and they're like, okay, I guess we can sell this company to have, like, more money to put into it. But then after a while, the people who were buying these were car and oil companies. So they just decided to, instead of rebuilding all of this, close it because hey we have this other flourishing business over here that we can actually make more money off of so they you know at the end of service lifetime they pretty much tore it all up and uh went to the car dealership yep and then and then uh bought buses to replace them because you know i mean buses are cars as well right very very large ones yes so yeah i guess the full story is a little bit more like, a little bit less exciting than that, which I think is why it doesn't get circulated quite as much, but I find it quite amusing. So, when when streetcar companies were first starting out, you know, you would kind of naturally have several competing streetcar companies in a city, but that doesn't really work as well, because, like, then you might end up with, like, duplicate lines, and, like, things just wouldn't line up very well. Um, think about, like, building a, the Transcontinental Railroad with two different companies, coming from opposite directions well yeah exactly so so what kind of naturally happened was in most cities like one person would start buying up all of the different companies that existed there thus creating a monopoly situation and so in order to avoid getting in trouble a lot like most of these monopolies would make a lot of kind of concessions um they would have to agree to a lot of terms from the city from the city governments in their area to continue operating. And a lot of these stipulations included things like keeping the, the fares at like a certain, a certain rate, you know, cause like that's kind of what you do with a monopoly, right? You take over the market and then you can like charge whatever you want to. And so, yeah, so they, they were like limited to usually five cents for a fare. And, uh, they also usually had to agree to things like maintaining the pavement immediately surrounding the, the, the rails that they used for their streetcars. And that, that worked all right for, for those companies for quite a few years until about World War I, um, when a few things kind of changed about the landscape. For one thing, inflation became actually kind of a, a thing that people had to think about, but they weren't allowed to raise the fare above five cents, even though if you accounted for inflation, you know, they would kind of naturally go up. Mm-hmm. Also, right around World War I, cars cars started to become a, a thing and um it didn't take 
very many cars on the road actually to really cause problems for streetcar lines because when just like 10% of the population owned cars, the streets became like just so congested that the streetcars couldn't run on schedule anymore because they were like locked up in traffic. And consider also that because these companies were maintaining the pavement around their tracks, who else uses that pavement? Well, cars do. Cars are the competition. So the like the streetcar lines were essentially subsidizing the infrastructure that cars used, while cars were causing them to not be able to operate nearly as well as they used to. So basically everything in this in this system was kind of rigged against the streetcars. And yeah, they they just naturally like they started losing money because they couldn't increase the fares to what they needed to for operating costs and and yeah, like there there was a company owned by GM that ended up buying out, I think about ten percent of the streetcar companies in the country, which is like that's a lot of companies when you think about it. But um, but you know, it, it wasn't like the overarching killer, you know, that it was portrayed as in like Who Framed Roger Rabbit or whatever. But yeah, so because by the time it, they were they were buying those out, they were basically you know they bankrupt already, which is why they were selling the companies. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that happened, you know, kind of the 50s and 60s were when the was when the the ending period of of the streetcar really was. Some of them started really like closing down as early as the 20s though. Yeah. So And I mean, then some, and some cities never stopped doing streetcars. Yes, yes. And in a lot of those cases, those were streetcar lines that had their own dedicated lanes, so they were actually able to keep running on time. So people actually like, kept uh, using them. Like Pittsburgh's. Yay! You can also find that whole problem yet again with our current Green Line rail. <laughs> Take why it away, they, Savannah. Why would they put it on the street? Why would they ever? Yeah, sure, our land isn't good enough to uh, dig tunnels and put it underground like a traditional subway, but you could elevate it like half of the blue line is. It's ridiculous not to elevate it when you go through university, which is a huge, like a big street in the middle of a bunch of residential areas. With, you know, a whole bunch of businesses on it. They made the construction. The construction took, like, what, three, four years? Five years? Something like, pretty much my entire college career. Yeah. So, like, five years. The construction was all up and down this huge, you know, place with a bunch of little businesses all through Frogtown and, uh, and university area. Shut down so many businesses. Now they're trying to revitalize it and gentrify it, and it's terrible. And they could have just... And it's not even good. It's not even good. It slows down. It stops at lights. You can't... You can just get on it without paying. Nobody cares. Nobody's watching you. There's hardly ever patrols on the trains or at the stations. Right. Whereas if they elevated it... If they elevated it it or put it underground, they would have barrier systems. So they're not even getting the revenue that they anticipated from the people who are using it. Nothing about it is okay. (laughs) I'm so angry. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it on uh, Google Street View right now. It's just, terrible. And they it's just it's just right there. Yeah, they kicked university down to like tiny tiny and they still have the bus route that runs the exact same route as the green line running right next to it at the same frequency. Why? Yeah, pretty much the only thing that it has going for it over the bus line is that it you know, it, it, it has fewer stops, so it is able to go just a little bit faster. But again, it does have to stop for lights if it happens to be there when they uh, are red. I think they do time it to go with the with the lights, but it doesn't always work. Especially not in downtown. No, right. Downtown takes, you know, 10 minutes to get out of, but then you're on your way. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And it's it, it seems so crazy to me that, like, I mean, I don't have to go over to Minneapolis very often, but like last year, uh, the few times that I did, only about a third of those times did Google Maps suggest the green line as the quickest way to get from St. Paul to Minneapolis, which is exactly what it was built for. Yeah, you would only take that if you're going directly from downtown St. Paul to downtown Minneapolis or the university campus. You can't take the green line to the blue line to get to the Mall of America because that's... That's a 90-degree angle it does, basically. Instead, you could take the 54 bus route and get there half an hour less. Mm-hmm. But nobody thinks of these things. Yeah. 
I'm also still kind of salty that, you know, there, there was a train line that went out to Elk River long before there was a light rail that came to uh, St. Paul. Yeah. So, you know, who cares about Elk River over St. Paul? I don't. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> also, one of the big problems with light rail systems and, and with uh, streetcars is that they cost a lot more to build than, you know, having a bunch of buses. But, like, the theory is that, like, those construction costs are going into making local construction jobs. So that's a positive thing. And then also, because the the rail system is so permanent, that then it will encourage more businesses to either get built, you know, get started, or stick around in the area around that route. Because, like, bus routes can be changed. And it's, yeah... And that's, that's more of a thing in favor of streetcars over light rail. Cause like, um, the differences between streetcars and light rail is, is that like streetcars make more frequent stops like buses do. And so there's more of an opportunity for people to be like, Oh, look at that cute little store. I'm going to hop off and go and see that. Whereas like by the time you see something in the light rail, you know, the, the next stop is like five blocks down. Yeah, the light rail really hasn't improved the situation around university really mainly because people are using it to go from downtown St. Paul to the university campus or Mm -hmm. to the, um, or to downtown Minneapolis. They're not stopping along the way. Right. Which is actually another big thing on, uh, when, when we started driving down to camp this year, we were seeing all of these signs that said like, no, Gosh, I forget what that line was called. But there was like a proposal of building a, a rapid train line between the Twin Cities and Rochester. Mm-hmm. And like everybody who lives along that that proposed route, which is essentially like right next to 52. All those um, little towns along the highway. Yeah. And well, and just like the farmers who live out there. Yeah. You know, they're all like, no, we don't want that because like nobody's going to stop there. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it, it doesn't serve them. It just goes through their area. Right. Yeah. It doesn't benefit them. Yeah, exactly. Well, wasn't that wasn't that a huge thing when they started implementing the interstate highways too? Like, probably, probably, yeah. 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 Though it is a lot easier to like get off of an interstate highway and interact with the towns that surround it than it would be to get off of a train and interact with, you know, cuz if I get off of a train, well, there goes my transportation method, whereas if you get off of a highway, I'm still in my car and I can drive anywhere I want. Yeah. So then, uh, I don't think you've mentioned this anywhere, but then there's the park and rides. Yeah, I've never understood that concept. Yeah, um, so I guess it would be a little bit more uh, pertinent here in Pittsburgh because of the uh, topography. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea is that you, uh, like, get in your car at your house, then you drive to a parking lot somewhere on the way between you and your destination, and then either hop on a bus or a light rail or something, and then take that to your destination. But you have to pay for park and rides, right? Depends on where. Uh, around here, there's plenty that are free, especially out oh. in the suburbs. Okay. Cause... Yeah, because I know that like the um, like the the movie theater that we go to all the time, Woodbury Ten, that's yeah. like a park and ride location, but it's like. I guess I guess part of the reason I've never really got the idea is because I don't live far away from the center of the city, mm-hmm. you know? So the only place that I would possibly park to get to a, a transit hub is in downtown, which is exactly what people are trying to avoid is parking downtown, yeah. you know? But, but then there's a little bit of a rub to that. Uh, uh, so do you have that Pittsburgh map handy? I do. Okay, so... If you go downtown, you'll see on the North Shore, the Heinz Field and PNC Park. Okay, those, yep. Those, those are like the big sports stadiums. Okay. And like all around there, there's parking everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I've actually uh, read that people will commute to those parking spaces, pay whatever fee it is for the parking, hop on the, uh, I guess it would be the subway there because it actually runs underground uh, because that's the free fare zone. So they pay to park, but the ride into downtown is free. Fascinating. Because it's pretty much just under the river, and it's right there. Okay, okay. Uh, In fact, uh, I remember 
uh, like a few years ago, like five years ago, those two stations on the North Shore opened. And for a while there, the Steelers was actually kind of funding the transit there. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is a bridge going from the uh, Steelers stadium to the nearby station. And I think, I'm not sure, maybe two years ago, they stopped funding it. But the uh, Port Authority said, we're going to keep on doing this because, like, we own some of the parking around here. And if we give up the free fare zone here, then that means, you know, we'll lose out on that money. So Park and Ride actually kind of ties into the microtransit um concept that we're going to talk about in just a little bit kind of as like the possibly the next iteration of public transit systems yeah so let's just dive right into that so microtransit is like the closest thing that that you could really compare it to is probably uber but it's got it's got more of a like ride sharing aspect to it because a lot of times when you like when you get an uber it's just you and the driver and they, they're taking you from one point to another Whereas microtransit systems do a little bit more of like, okay, so we've got like these two people who are fairly close together right now, and they're both going from this area to another similar area. So we're going to pick both of them up along this route and take them to where they're going. And and there, there's some variation on how all of them work. You know, some of them just like have predetermined, well, like have routes that, that are fixed, but the routes are determined by the the demands of the the user base right so once they get like a a certain mass of people who need to get from this neighborhood to the other neighborhood then they'll have a route that that runs that others like kind of change the routes on the fly so like as as you're riding in a thing um, the driver might just get an update on their phone right there that says like okay we're going to divert you a couple of blocks over so that you can go and pick up somebody else cuz they're going on on a trip that's similar to the route that you're going on already right now it's pretty much just private companies that are doing this and of course like every single different city has like a different company that operates there and some of them some of them are going to be bumping into like legal hurdles the way that Uber has um with municipal governments like trying to crack down on them but others are actually trying to work with the public transit like authorities in their areas to kind of like smooth the gaps between the existing public transit routes and these new microtransit systems cuz one of one of the big drawbacks of public transit systems is that they they're not agile right they can't like change their routes very quickly based on changing user requirements you know they 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 do collect a lot of data on like you know what routes people are taking who gets on where and gets off where and stuff but like they they don't use that data as much as they probably should um so microtransit systems are designed to like take full advantage of that data see i find this concept a little hard to wrap my head around but i don't really think i like it no no okay um i just don't like the idea of like what? What is it? You just get in a van with a bunch of other people and Pretty they much. shuttle you around. And I'm not fond of that. I just want to get to where I'm going on my own terms. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, and they did talk about how there's kind of the possibility that this could result in like a two tiered transit system where like people who can't afford to pay a premium have to go on the pre existing routes with lots of other people, but then like people who can pay a little extra can get a more direct route See, using these microtransit. I don't like that systems. either unless they're both public. Right. I don't want to pay a private company more to do that for me when the revenue isn't going to fund the transit system as a whole. Right. Yeah. Ideally, ideally it is the municipal system that is doing both of them because then they can kind of grow in tandem and, and work off of each other effectively Whereas, like, if, if we just, if we have pub or private companies growing these microtransit systems, then they are directly competing with existing public transit systems in a lot public of cases. Public transit is always going to lose. Right. Public yeah. transit is, <laughs> it's, it's but, bad. But, you know, again, this is kind of at a premium. 
Mm-hmm. So it depends on how much that premium is worth to people. Yeah. And the, the, the prices that they're citing here is like, it'll, it costs, uh, like two or three more dollars for a fare on these micro transit systems than it does on, on a public, public transit That's system. That's a significant amount. Yeah, it is. Um, Especially when you're riding it all the time. But consider that it's still like a quarter of what a cab fare would be. And probably like no one would, no one would use those. Yeah, exactly. So it's really it's really cab systems that are that are losing out, which I'm totally fine with because those are almost as inefficient as car individual car ownership. But when you compare the prices to this microtransit thing to owning your own car and paying for gas and insurance for that, if you don't, you know, if you drive a lot, if you well, if you if you ride it a lot or if you, you know, it it could equal out to. Mm. It's better to own your own car at that point. Yeah. Like when we were using car to go, I would be paying six dollars to go to work every day. That's a little ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah. that's that's what essentially what you're asking me to do here is pay five or six dollars to go somewhere. Why would I do that? Why would I do that if I can, you know, use the public transit system that we already have and not have to pay that much? All I'm right. saving up for my own car probably. Uh, for the next tier of transportation i don't want that mid-tier costing me more money Mm -hmm. which is yeah so one of the one of the proposed kind of solutions or or ways that this can work with the public transit systems is to be the solution for the the kind of last mile problem because quite often it's like you can you can get very easily from one part of a metro area to another but then like that last transfer from the main bus line to like your house, your like specific small neighborhood mm-hmm. is, is where the, the biggest kind of the biggest pain point in, in the, uh, the, the trip is right. Yeah. So having these micro transit routes that go from like main transit hubs out to where people actually live to their final destinations but you're still asking me to pay three more dollars oh, yeah, no, for I'm, them to do this. So so if yeah, if if it were designed to serve that purpose, then it would probably just be part of the fare of the public transportation system as okay, a but whole. That, that makes my public transportation system fare go up as a whole. Probably by a little bit. Well, maybe. I mean, if if it were municipally owned, they would probably just absorb that cost. If everyone was know? paying for the light rail, then we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> It all comes back to the light rail, doesn't it? Yeah. Depends on the details. Yeah. And I'm I'm just like I'll talk about this a lot more in the future of transportation episode, which will be the last one that we do in this little mini series, but I'm really really attracted to the idea of a a world where like nobody has to own individual cars and then there's just like this fleet of uh of like self-driven cars that do essentially what this microtransit system is doing and then there's no need for strict rigid routes of public transit cuz they like they they could have all sorts of sized diff- different sized like vehicles very large buses for uh routes that are heavily used by lots of people cuz then you can just cram a bunch of people into it at high capacity times but it could still like it could still pick people up from from very close to where they live yeah or no, that, eventually maybe turn those into rail lines yeah although yeah although rail lines are like you know once you build it you still you can't change the route which kind of defeats the whole concept of this of this like this although, system that can that can change to meet demand although if it's hev- constantly heavily used it's probably going to be constantly heavily used in the future Right, though we never know because unless things you have change. a better alternative, yeah, exactly. Which is what this fleet might be right because yeah, because the streetcar systems were very heavily used way back in the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. But then you know, changing landscapes, the future is coming. <gasps> <laughs> And then the last thing that I put in here for a talking point is um, here 
actually right here on the east side of St. Paul, one of our high schools um, has been part of a pilot program where they, instead of using the big yellow city uh, school buses, they ha- have all their students getting to school on city buses. And so there, there are a couple of like special lines that go specifically like they, they go along an established route for most of the time, but then they like change last minute to like get to Johnson High School kind of thing. And I actually, I accidentally got on one of those one time. I didn't realize that I was getting on this, what's the 74? Yeah, the 74J instead of like the 74K. Uh, and I was like, why are all these people so young on this bus? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. See, I, high school is fine. Yeah. But I don't think anyone under 14 should be left to use the public transit system alone. Agreed. Agreed. And especially in the mix with, you know, other patrons of the system. Mm-hmm. I don't. I think they should be. Res- somebody should be responsible for responsible for them and their safety. Right. If you if you had to have like a school official on every single one of those buses, in addition to the driver and stuff, that just gets out of hand pretty quick. So yeah, yeah limiting it to high schools would probably be a good move. I I hear. I obviously I don't teach at Johnson. I teach at Harding. Um, and this actually, this article that I linked to is a an article written for the school newspaper by one of our students about the situation. But like, I think Johnson got to start an hour later mm-hmm. because of the advantages of the bus system, which is attractive to me. But then, yeah, another another kind of pro for it is that it it gets students used to using the bus system, mm-hmm. which is something that I never got to do as a kid. Buses and, were scary for me oh, when yeah. I was young. Because, mm-hmm. like, you never know where they're going to take you. Yeah. Except that you co- totally could know. You just have to look it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> much, it's much easier now and in today's world. Like, even when we were still in high school, most of us didn't have smartphones yet. We didn't have access to Google Maps all the time. We Google didn't. Maps didn't have that data back then, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And, and Metro Transit's website was a disaster, <laughs> I'm sure. But we didn't we didn't know where anything went. We couldn't know. Mm-hmm. And we the best that you could do was get on a bus and get the pamphlet with a map and then you had to interpret a map. Yeah. How many high schoolers know how to do that? Well, the Boy Scout does. Shut up. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, so I mean like I think it's a pretty cool concept and I I, I don't know if it's more or less cost effective. I haven't talked to any of like the administrators or the district level people or whatever um you know to find out how it went so we'll see we'll see if it ends up getting pushed to other high schools um i don't know if it would allow us to bring back like the the high school magnet schools you know because like it used to be that wherever you were in saint paul you could go to any one of the high schools yeah and they would bus you there um that's not the case anymore now due it's to funding yeah due to funding and and so now it's yeah, down more to your neighborhood school you have like two or two or three cho- choices, which has drastically hurt diversity in our schools. Absolutely. So, so yeah, I, th- I mean, we really, we need to be able to bus people around. Mm-hmm. And if the, if the transit system is going to make it easy for people to do that, then fine. But people are still not going to take the bus for an hour to get to school. That's, no. That's yeah. atrocious. Right. You're talking about if they had to figure out like, a route that a, a metro transit route that wasn't yeah they could pre made for them yeah I would imagine they would have pre made neighborhood routes but people coming from outside the neighborhood would have would be issued a school pass mm-hmm. but would have to figure it out on their own like I'm sure they would be advised but it wouldn't be specifically for them they wouldn't be riding with a ton of other high schoolers right that would yeah. be a very different experience for those kids yeah definitely. And I, yeah, I don't think it would be necessarily a negative experience. It would just be. Depends on who you are. Yeah, exactly. You, you're, you're a non-threatening white man. Thank you. You don't have the same experiences as everyone else in the world. I got no. cat called walking here. That's true. I am not that attractive. I didn't even notice it happening. Yep. Nope. Oblivious. Wee. But imagine all these 14, 14 to 18 year old kids, mm-hmm. little girls on the bus. Yeah. Yeah. Going through all this inner city stuff. You don't know who's out there. Nope. I got hugged by some random guys on the street in downtown once. Huh. Yeah. It's weird. You got mugged? No, I got hugged. Which is better? 
<laughs> Probably. <laughs> I don't know. It's a little odd. Yeah. So, very different experience. A lot of people might be uncomfortable with it. Just make sure that you have pizza with you to give out. That solves all of our problems. Uh-huh. So thank you for listening, everybody, to this episode of The Extra Dimension, uh, as this is our show that has a variety of topics. If you have something that you want us to cover, go ahead and let us know. You could possibly click on the contact link uh, in the show notes. So if you go to thenexus.tv slash TED14, you'll see a contact us link uh, right underneath our names and beautiful faces. Alternatively... You can uh, hit me up on Twitter. I am Ian R. Buck. Andrew, where, where can we find you on the internet? I have a blog, but you can also go and listen to my uh, podcast, Control Structure. And if you would like to send feedback directly to me, you can use the Contact Us feature there. Mm-hmm. And you can find me on Twitter, at Eternally Anna. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one. <laughs>